And then I am going to hand over to Liz to get started telling us all of her hints and tricks for dealing with diagnosing, managing and maximizing um, the treatment of canine and feline diabetes. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Anna. So yes, tonight we'll just be talking about canine and feline diabetes and I apologise, I know that the advertising said I would also talk about the ugly friend that is DKA, but I did commit too much and as I was getting through DKA I realised I just couldn't cover all of it in one webinar, so I promise that next time I will do a DK only session so it can get it's undivided um, attention that it deserves. So I apologize if you have come for the DK section, it will be next time. So if we look, I guess, just at the start at some of the recent literature, so there are a few management guidelines and consensus statements that have been published in the last few years. So if this is an area that's of particular interest to you, then uh, by all means, those guidelines and management sort of articles are probably worth tracking down. But we're going to start with feline diabetes because I think that has some really interesting factors that aren't present so much in canine diabetes, but we certainly will be getting to dogs for the second half of the session. So if we try and compare diabetes to some of the human terminology that we know, type one diabetes in people is where there's the immune mediated destruction of beta cells and that causes an absolute insulin deficiency. And that version is actually quite rare in cats. Comparing to type two diabetes in people, which is where there is an insulin resistance and the beta cells cannot sort of mount an appropriate response to maintain a normal blood glucose level, that is the more common form of diabetes in cats. Now, there are certainly other forms of diabetes in cats, such as beta cell loss due to pancreatitis or neoplasia. And certainly we do see insulin resistance due to other diseases and um, particularly acromegaly and hyperadrenocorticism. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the clinical signs of diabetes with the main ones being PUPD, polyphagia and weight loss. The diagnostic guidelines, again, you probably know this are for just um, persistent hypoglycemia, but the important thing to think about is also pre-diabetes. So that's in cats that have a blood glucose that's consistently in the range of 6.5 to 10, and they're pre-diabetic, and they need a little bit more monitoring for when they potentially transition to overt diabetes. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we have in cats is diagnosing diabetes in the confounding nature of stress hypoglycemia. So what we can actually see is that there can be an increase in glucose and that can occur as quickly as 10 minutes after some acute stressful incident. And it can actually take hours to return back to the reference range. Now they generally say that stress is unlikely to cause a blood glucose level that's greater than about 16 millimoles per litre. However, there are some cases that the glucose just seems to go really, really high. So if you aren't sure if you can trust an in-clinic blood glucose reading, then that is definitely an indication to potentially screen for urine glucose at home or do some home glucose, blood glucose monitoring. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I wanted to sort of just highlight some of the key features of these diseases that you may not be aware of. I didn't want to just run through the normal day-to-day -day diabetic management and diagnosis, because I'm sure you all know that. Um, but I did want to touch on fructosamine. So there are definitely some really strong indications to use a fructosamine level. However, I think there is also sometimes an over-reliance on fructosamine. So in cats, fructosamine levels really reflect the mean glucose concentration for about the preceding week, maybe a little bit longer in dogs. And it can be useful for the diagnosis of diabetes and it can also be used for the monitoring um, of diabetes, although not so much as a standalone test in that setting. Um, however, the blood glucose has to be really quite high and it needs to be quite high for quite some time to influence your fructosamine levels and actually increase them. So keep in mind, it may not be that useful in cats who have a very recent development di diabetes or for those that have very mild disease. Now, the reasons for why you might get a lower fructosamine other than due to blood glucose levels, and this goes for cats as well as dogs, is in hypoproteinemia. 
if they're azotemic and specifically if they're also hypoalbuminemic, but hyperlipidemia and hemolysis can interfere with your fructosamine level. So do just interpret that in light of any other changes on your blood work. So diabetic remission is a part of feline diabetes management that I think is really exciting and sometimes overlooked. So when you diagnose a cat with diabetes, the decision is really going to be what is the goal? And that is something that you have to have a really long conversation with owners about. Do you want to try and achieve diabetic remission? Or is your goal more about controlling the clinical signs and managing glycemic control whilst avoiding hypoglycemia? Now, remission, remission rates of greater than 80% have actually been reported in the veterinary literature, which is really quite high. But if you're trying to achieve remission, then achieving normoglycemia quickly is really part of the plan. And one main mechanism by which diabetic remission is thought to occur in cats is through the reversal of what's called glucotoxicity. And glucotoxicity refers to this decrease in beta cell function and beta cell mass that's caused by persistent hyperglycemia. So what happens when their glucose goes up is that impacts beta cell function and then they get more hyperglycemic and then that impacts beta cell function more and it's one of these vicious cycles. So specific to diabetic remission, if that's going to be your goal, is that when you start insulin, your blood glucose curves need to be occurring quite frequently. So they're often performed every three to five days. And if there's an inadequate, an inadequate response at that point, then your insulin dose needs to be increased. Because of the frequency of monitoring when trying to achieve remission, and it's really imperative to avoid making decisions based on a stress hypoglycemia, Home glucose monitoring is really important in these patients if the goal is diabetic remission. So often the insulin dose is increased about every sort of between three sort of five to seven days until you get a really nice and tight blood glucose curve with your glucose being between about four and 10 millimoles per litre. Now these cases are often where there's an indication for drugs called glucocon-like peptide agonists. So there's one called exenatide extended release and that drug augments insulin secretion and it can actually increase the remission rates of, cat, of cats who are also on glygine. And it's an injection given about once a week and studies have shown that in cats on glygine, if you also supplement them with one of these gluco glucagon-like peptide agonists, that you can increase your remission rate further. So there is actually potentially some steps beyond just really aggressive insulin treatment to, to achieve remission. Liz, can I, sorry, interrupt, um, yes. and ask, are they actually available in Australia? I think the um, Xenotide extended release is, but some of the others aren't. The last time I looked into it, it's not a cheap drug, but it's only once a week um, but if you can achieve remission in those cats then often they recommend to continue the exenatide extended release without the exogenous insulin so it does depend a little bit on the financial commitment of the owner but you could potentially withdraw it and see if you can manage those cats on diet alone cool thanks so some of the factors that we associate with diabetic remission include having those cats on a low carbohydrate diet Certainly having them on a good, uh, a good insulin, so a long-acting insulin like glargine certainly helps. Cats that are a higher age when they're diagnosed with diabetes are more likely to go into remission if they have a lower maximum dose of insulin. Really early institution of tight glycemic control is key. So this, if you get good control within the first six months. Having said that, if you have cats who have been on insulin for longer than six months, then they can still achieve remission. Recent corticosteroid administration provided you can withdraw the gluco, um, gluco corticosteroids that can help with inducing remission. If they don't have any signs of neuropathy, and with that it's because cats who have a neuropathy, so for example that plantigrade stance or if they're hesitant jumping, then it normally implies that their diabetes has been more chronic and so they're harder to get into remission for that reason. So if they don't have those signs, they're good candidates for remission. If they have a lower mean glucose concentration after being treated with insulin and lower cholesterol concentrations are also a good indicator for going into remission. 
So performing really good blood glucose curves is something I'm really, really super passionate about because I think it's one of the things with diabetic cats that we can really do well. And when we don't do well, we're absolutely shooting ourselves in the foot with that. So home glucose monitoring is always preferable. And I really don't do any blood glucose curves in cats to determine insulin doses in hospital anymore. And the key advantages of home glucose curves is that they are less expensive for the owner. If you do a curve and you get a really confusing result that you just can't explain, then the curve is really easily repeated and owners are quite happy to do that rather than bring them in hospital for another curve. And it's absolutely there is less stress for the pet than being in hospital. So with home glucose monitoring, I either use the AlphaTrack glucometer. So that has the benefits in that it's calibrated for cats and it requires a really small blood volume compared to the human glucometers. And I ideally avoid the human glucometers as they can give either falsely low readings or falsely high readings. The other product that has become more readily available recently and that we use in dogs and cats is the Freestyle Libra. And that is a product for humans. And it's a small sensor that is attached to their skin and it actually measures the interstitial glucose levels. Now the sensor life that comes with the Freestyle Libra is, Libra is up to 14 days, which allows for at least one insulin dose adjustment during the period of the sensor, provided the pet doesn't scratch it off. Having said that, even in pets that have the Freestyle Libra, I still like owners to have an alpha track glucometer at home um, because then they can do glucose readings if they're ever worried. So for example, if they don't have the Freestyle Libra on at the time, but it also allows them to make sure there is a correlation between a blood glucose level and an interstitial glucose reading in the event that they get a wacky result. Now we do know that glucose curves actually vary quite significantly from day to day. So it's really important that we again set ourselves up for success when making decisions about insulin dosing and the confounding factor of stress within hospital curves because they just really do complicate things. So in this graph, it shows a blood glucose curve from the same cat and the orange line with the circles, which is the lower line, is the at-home curve. And the blue line with the squares at the top is the in-clinic curve. So if we assess the at-home curve, so the orange one at the bottom, it actually looks like a pretty good curve, except for the nadir that is a, little, that is a bit hypoglycemic at 2.8 millimoles. So based on that, you would actually decrease your insulin dose. But if we then compare it to the in-clinic curve, those glucose levels are way too high and you would actually increase the insulin dose. So keep in mind that this is on the same cat just a few days later. So it's likely that the in-clinic curve is due to stress and it's not a true reflection of the glycemic control. So at-home glucose curves are likely more accurate, but I do acknowledge that they do require a bigger time commitment by the owner. And that's where sometimes the interstitial glucose readers such as the Freestyle Libra are quite easy. So there is a lot of pressure on owners who are doing glucose measurements and there was actually a study that looked at the acceptance of home blood glucose monitoring by owners and the impact that it sort of had on the quality of life of the cat and also the quality of life of the owner having to perform them. And we know that in that study that the owners were actually really good at accepting home glucose monitoring. Although I appreciate that potentially those that participated in the study may be more committed owners, but it was still a really promising sign. And I normally say to owners that I would rather you try home glucose monitoring and then fail, and then we just know it's not an option for that particular cat and their owner, than to not try it at all. So this is a Freestyle Libra that might be new to some of you out there, and it's really useful for home glucose monitoring. So the Freestyle Libra comes with this little disposable single use sensor, which is the round disc that you can see on the screen. And it's got an adhesive underside that then adheres to the skin. And the sensor lasts up to 14 days, and it starts working after one hour once you apply it on the skin. So once you start applying these yourself in the clinic, I actually find it's really weird because you start noticing humans out there that are wearing them and you'll kind of like be in the you know, line at Woolies and you'll see someone with this Freestyle Libra on and you sort of 
realize that you're inadvertently staring at them just because you now know what they are and how cool they are. So I warn you that sometimes it's a little bit odd, but they're really useful and I highly recommend that you start using them and they're very easy to source. The other thing that it comes with is this little reader, which is in the um, drawing of the, it's a human picture. So you can see the little sensor on this person's arm and then it's a little reader smaller than an iPhone. And that little reader does need to be charged intermittently, but otherwise it's a really simple setup. So the owner needs to scan the sensor on the skin about every hour, eight, every eight hours so that they can save the data that's on there. And what you do when you're applying is you need to apply that sensor on a flat area of skin that has limited movement. So where the dog or cat can't reach with their mouth to chew or their back leg to scratch. And we usually apply it around the neck or up on the cranial thorax. So you start by clipping the hair over the area you wipe it with alcohol and let it dry, then apply the sensor using this sensor applicator that comes in the pack. You can apply a few drops of tissue glue onto the sensor, but just make sure you don't actually touch the needle that's in the middle. So you place this sensor applicator over the site and you push down with quite firm pressure to apply the sensor and you just hold it there for 30 seconds and you then gently pull this applicator away from the site and then you can activate your sensor. And there's a bunch of videos online of how to do it. And in fact, really dedicated owners will actually apply their own sensors. So it is really quite simple to use. I have had one disaster cat who just hated having the Freestyle Libra on and they went and hid under the bed the minute they got home from the vet clinic and they just scratched and scratched at their, um, back, the back of their neck until it came off and it did bleed, which was, luckily it was a very understanding owner, um, but most pets are pretty tolerant. I think, whilst I have had a few cats who have let the sensor last the 14 days, I do prep a lot of cat owners that the cats do manage to, them to, get, manage to get them off prior to the 14 day interval. Um, the same goes for dogs, but dogs are generally a little bit better at tolerating the sensor. So I apologize, I couldn't find my picture of the cat wearing the Freestyle Libra. So just imagine that this is a cat, but you can see the little sensor just behind the right shoulder there. And what this Freestyle Libra does is it measures the interstitial fluid glucose concentration. And you can see the little pin on the back of the sensor when it's on its side, on the side of the presentation. And that is really quite small. It's about five centimeters long and not particularly thick. Now, the concern is that it measures interstitial glucose, not blood glucose. And there is a little bit of a lag between interstitial glucose and blood glucose levels, but only by about 10 minutes. So if your blood glucose is increasing really quickly, then your interstitial fluid glucose is going to be a bit lower than your blood glucose. And then the flip side of that is if, if your blood glucose is decreasing really quickly, then your interstitial fluid glucose could be a bit higher than your blood glucose. But that rarely matters by a significant amount because it is only about a 10 minute lag. With the reader, if it displays low, then the glucose reading is less than 2.2 millimoles. And if the reader displays high, then we know the glucose reading is greater than 27.5 millimoles. Now, the other key thing with monitoring that I think is really important is looking at body weight. And I think it's often an underutilized monitoring tool for diabetic cats. So if you have a cat who seems poorly controlled, but is gaining weight, then that should ring some alarm bells. But also if it's an obese cat where you are actively trying to get them to lose weight, because we know that peripheral insulin resistance comes with obesity, then it's really important in the clinical record that you sort of that you notify other clinicians that you are actively trying to diet this cat because knowing what the body weight is doing is really important when you're interpreting glucose curves and what you're going to be doing with your insulin. So one of the key things with diabetes management is you need to maintain reasonable expectations for your response to therapy. So when you're starting your insulin, monitoring is more about identifying hypoglycemia. It's not about achieving real, really ideal glycemic control. And I think one of the things that vets are terrible at is just waiting and giving time for things to do things. I think when we see changes, we wanna act on it. And often with diabetes, Sometimes it's just about sitting back and waiting and letting the insulin do its thing. 
So changes in insulin are really based on both the persistence of clinical signs, but also the assessment of glycemia. So you need to be interpreting both of those things. And I generally don't make any dose changes more frequently than any, every five to seven days, unless there is hypoglycemia. So that is absolutely an indication to do something and don't just sit and wait on those ones. So when it comes to insulin, the important thing with insulin is understanding the expected nadir time of the insulin you've chosen and the duration of action. So we'll talk about glygine and detamir as they would be your first and second line insulin treatments in cats. Can insulin is probably the third insulin I would go to for a cat. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to dogs. So glygine insulin is your first choice for insulin in most cats. It has a duration of action that is quite variable, so between 10 and 24 hours. And then a deer, at least in healthy cat studies, is at about 12 to 14 hours. Therefore, the nadir may occur in some cats at the time of your next insulin dosing. So don't worry if you've given a breakfast dose of insulin and then when you're about to give dinner that your nadir is happening at that point and then you suddenly panic and back off your insulin dose. Now, when you're dosing cats on glycine every 12 hours, there's this really beautiful overlap of insulin action and that results in this continuous glucose lowering effect over the 24 hour period. The dose of glycine is about a quarter of a unit per kilo based on ideal body weight subcutaneously if your glucose is less than 20 millimoles or half a unit per kilo if your blood glucose is higher. But when starting, the maximum dose is about three units per cat twice a day. And what's really reassuring with glycine is when they've looked at biochemical hypoglycemia with glycine at these starting doses, none of eight cats in a study developed any clinical signs. So if you're using sort of relatively conservative doses with those starting doses, then it's quite safe. Moving on to detamine, which is the second line insulin treatment for diabetic cats and maybe one that people are a little bit less familiar with. It has actually a very similar duration of action as glygine. Therefore, like glygine, the nadir may occur in some cats at the time of your next dosing. However, it is reported that there is a bit less variability between cats on detamir than with glygine. So I'll normally go to detamir if I have a cat where I feel like I've controlled all of the possible variables, but I'm just still not getting a really nice curve on glygine. It's a really good uh, insulin for cats who seem to have a short duration of action on glygine. So think about detamir in those situations. The dose of detamir is the same for glygine. However, most cats often require about 25 to 30% less glygine. So probably round down when you're starting out with detamir in cats. And also just be aware that cats can exhibit an initial increased sensitivity to detamir. And that's transient. And it typically lasts about 24 to 48 hours. So just keep an eye out for that. If you are changing from glygine to another insulin, the recommendation is just go down to about half the current insulin dose, but then increase it about within 48 hours if you're seeing an insufficient effect on reducing your blood glucose levels. Um, oh, no, we will talk about can insulin, sorry. So um, always use an appropriate syringe for the insulin. I find it really hard and you need to constantly do the maths if you're changing between a 100 unit per mil syringe to a 40 unit mil syringe if you're using not the appropriate insulin concentration. Um, with can insulin, it has a duration of action of approximately eight to 12 hours. So expect the blood glucose to return to a pre-injection level a few hours before the next injection is due. So anticipate some hyperglycemia before that second injection. The short, it has quite a short duration of action. Um, and then a deer is about three to six hours. So again, you're gonna see that much earlier than with some of your other insulins. So in regards to insulin storage, if you follow the manufacturer's recommendation, glycine should be stored at room temperature. And when done so, it has a shelf life of 28 days after opening. And detamir at room temperature has a shelf life of about six weeks after opening. However, they are relatively stable and many owners can keep the insulin for several months if they store it in the fridge. 
However, if the insulin appears cloudy or discolored, then they do need to discard it. And it is just really important that owners know to be cautious if they are deviating from manufacturer's recommendations. And we'll talk, we will talk about the can insulin storage when we get to dogs. So diet is really important in the management of diabetic cats. And I think it should be considered just as serious as you know, insulin is for diabetic cats. So it is more natural for cats to eat a high protein and fat meal and carbohydrates really shouldn't make up a significant percentage of their intake. However, I mean, that is really very different to the diet we feed domestic cats when they're on a dry food diet. Dietary management of the diabetic cat focuses on limiting your carbohydrate intake. And this is important because regardless of whether you're feeding them as standalone meals or more of an ad lib feeding schedule in cats, the higher carbohydrate diets result in this significantly higher postprandial blood glucose level. So when you reduce the dietary carbohydrate, you're reducing the demand on the pancreatic beta cells to produce insulin. Now, it is currently unknown what the optimal dietary carbohydrate content is for diabetic cats. However, the consensus statements suggest a restricted, restricted carbohydrate content of less than 12% metabolizable energy is probably appropriate for cats. So this means that most wet cat foods and prescription diabetic management dry cat foods are sufficiently carbohydrate restricted. In addition, the duration and actually the level of postprandial increases in blood glucose are exacerbated by weight gain and obesity. Therefore, it is really important to achieve an ideal body condition score in diabetic cats. And achieving that ideal body condition will help you maintain remission, but also improves insulin sensitivity. The other cases where it's important to implement dietary management is in those cats who are at risk of developing overt diabetes. So if, for example, you have an old cat with risk factors such as a breed or they have steroid use or they're overweight, then they should probably be fed a low carbohydrate diet as well. So the problem diabetics really are the cases that kind of keep you up at night and they can be really tricky and really fiddly. So if insulin doses are greater than about one to one and a half units per kilo twice a day, then you should be thinking about investigating into diseases that cause insulin resistance. The main diseases for cats that you should have on your radar will be acromegaly and hyper A, pancreatitis, urinary tract infections or chronic kidney disease, and hypothyroidism. So the role of the Samoggi effect is actually quite controversial in the veterinary literature at the moment, and we probably have been sort of putting the blame on the Samoggi effect for diabetics in the past that was probably unfounded. So the Samoggi effect is when hypoglycemia triggers this counter-regulatory -regul response, leading to this rebound in hyperglycemia. So it's also being referred to as overswing phenomenon and hypoglycemia-induced hyperglycemia or rebound hyperglycemia. However, it's important to know that actually most cases of apparent rebound hypoglycemia are actually just from insufficient insulin dosing rather than the Samoggi effect. So you should absolutely be reducing the insulin dose if hypoglycemia occurs. However, it is very normal for blood glucose levels to fluctuate in the first few weeks of treatment. So it's important to give these cases time and consistent dosing as these fluctuations will often just settle down. So there is definitely the goal in cats are trying to achieve diabetic remission um, in particular candidates and they need to have really committed owners. And certainly if you have one of those cases and you're not familiar with the protocol, then we can certainly talk through them on a case by case basis. But it generally requires much more intensive and more aggressive insulin treatment. Approximately 25 to 30% of cats in diabetic remission will relapse. So they'll go back to requiring their exogenous insulin. And less than 25% of those cats will achieve a second remission. 
So based on the ISFM 2016 guidelines on diabetics and cats, they recommend that when you're giving an insulin dose of half a unit per cat per day, so that's either half a unit per cat once a day or a quarter of a unit per cat twice a day. So if they're on that kind of dosing and their blood glucose remains normal, then you can stop giving insulin. If they remain negative for glucosuria or they're euglycemic and they can maintain that for two to four weeks without any insulin, that's when you can officially declare diabetic remission. Absolutely, those cats should be, may, be maintained on a low carbohydrate diet, and they obviously just need really close monitoring of their glucose um, in either urine or blood because we know that they often come out of remission. So, there is definitely more to managing diabetic cats than just starting them on their insulin and basing decisions on their glucose curve. So, your management goals for the insulin dependent diabetic cats should be maintaining a blood glucose where you want sort of a peak of about 10 to 14 millimoles and an adhere of about 4.5 to 8 millimoles. You absolutely need to be avoiding clinical hypoglycemia, attempting remission if you've got owners that are willing to do so. Um, an improvement or resolution of clinical signs. So do they have appropriate water intake? Is there subjective reduction in urine production? Are they maintaining body condition? And are you checking that body weight regularly? What is the cat's overall well-being? So the cat's demeanor and their energy levels. You really do need to maintain good dietary control. So maintaining that low carbohydrate diet and certainly be doing regular home glucose monitoring or interstitial glucose monitoring, or even urine glucose monitoring every now and then. So that's the end of cats. So if there's any questions on cats, or we can go to dogs and then do questions at the end. No? We'll keep going. Okay, so with dogs, when we look at the human equivalent, so dogs are more like human type one diabetes. Now, with dogs, they can have what's called the honeymoon period, and that can be seen in newly diagnosed diabetic dogs where they have this beautiful response to super low doses of insulin. So I'm talking less than 0.2 units per kilo per injection. And I'm sorry to burst you the honeymoon bubble, but these dogs will ultimately disappoint you and become more difficult to manage and they will require more insulin within a few months. Um, and that's just because the residual beta cells die and they're just not replaced. So just be watching those cases because their insulin requirements will ultimately go up. So again, you all know the clinical presentation of dogs. And I think probably one thing is that often just shocks me is the way that dogs get cataracts and sometimes they just feel like they go, they become um, they blind and develop these cataracts overnight. So I think that they are candidates to see an ophthalmologist or someone in your clinic who is really interested in eyes and cataract management um, for them to see someone at the very beginning of their diagnosis so they could be prepped for what things will look like if their dog has significant loss of their vision or needs cataract surgery. So the problem with cataracts is that they can develop even despite really rapid and excellent glycemic control. So you need to be watching really closely for that. In dogs with diabetes, the increase in ALP and ALT is rarely greater than about 500 units per litre. So if it's bigger than that, then probably some kind of imaging is recommended as you need to go looking for another cause just in case there is something else going on. Now, exercise is really important to make owners aware of and that exercise needs to be as consistent as what they do with um, the injection timing of their insulin and their diet. So exercise decreases glucose concentration by increasing the absorption of insulin from its injection site. It will increase uh, blood flow and insulin delivery to exercise in muscles. It stimulates upregulation of glucose transporters in muscle cells and just increases glucose disposal. So timing and the amount of exercise each day needs to be really consistent. Now, again, you all know the different types of insulin and the indications for each. So I'm just going to highlight some of the key points to have on your radar. 
So in dogs, Detamir is about four times more potent compared to other insulins. Therefore, they are much lower doses that are needed when you're starting Detamir. So the starting dose is about 0.1 unit per kilo twice a day in dogs. And the key thing with insulin handling is that for most insulins, just gently rolling is suggested for them. However, with can insulin, it should actually be shaken quite thoroughly because you want to get this uniformly sort of milky suspension. So again, with um, home glucose monitoring, I'm a big fan of it and I still have no desire to do in-clinic glucose um, curves in dogs as well as with cats. Um, however, I do just keep in mind that nothing is perfect. So with the alpha track, they can overestimate blood glucose values, potentially missing hypoglycemia. So just anticipate that. And the meter is less accurate in dogs that have a hematocrit less than 30%, which with stable diabetics is less of an issue. But if you are using it in um, maybe DK patients who are a bit anemic after being unwell, just anticipate that. And one study did show that with the freestyle, the freestyle Libra is quite accurate with hyperglycemia and euglycemia, but it is less accurate if the glucose concentrations are less than about 4.5. But that's sort of getting down to the level where they're getting hypoglycemic and you would be changing your insulin dose. So the exact number may not matter so much. So one of the major troubleshooting situations you'll be in with dogs with a glucose curve is getting a nice nadir. So your ideal glucose nadir should be between about five and eight and a half millimoles. And when you're seeing a really low nadir, the reason that you need to be thinking about are either insulin overdose, um, is there excess overlap of the insulin action? Are you getting um, prolonged periods without food? And then also the impact of strenuous exercise. And duration of action can actually be altered sometimes by just changes in the diet, but alternatively you can change to a different insulin product. And similarly to cats, try not to change insulin more frequently than every five to seven days, except if you're experiencing hypoglycemia. So reasons for insulin ineffectiveness. So when you can blame the insulin is if you have inactive insulin, the insulin is diluted, it's been improperly administered. So for example, if the owners are just administering air bubbles, certainly an inadequate dose, potentially the Samoggy response. However, we may be overplaying that card. Is there inadequate frequency of insulin administration? impaired insulin absorption from the injection site, and lastly, insulin binding antibodies, although that's less of an issue with some of the insulins we're using these days. Now, if we look at the list of diseases in dogs which contribute to insulin resistance, it's just crazy long, and you know this list probably isn't even covering all of the things there. So the tricky thing is if you are experiencing insulin resistance is where to go looking. And sometimes the clinical signs are not particularly helpful. And as a result, the diagnostic tests for investigating insulin resistance are really quite long. So some of the more standard ones, like looking at general blood work and urine and maybe some abdominal imaging, but then there are also are going to be some sort of more specific tests that we might need to do. So again, you may need to cast a really wide net when looking into these cases. And that's it. And as I said, I promise we'll get a DK talk later on. Thanks, Liz. That's a lot of inf information to cover. I can't imagine going through DKA after your <laughs> well, um, It should be a fun one. I know, um, I think there's a lot of controversial things in DK, like the fluids and there's different protocols for, you know, CRIs versus an injectable insulin. So I think we can do a pretty good deep dive into DK next time. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, anybody got any questions? Feel free to message them through and I can read them out if you don't want to speak. No. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Next will be Mariano, 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Oops, hang on. I've got a question from Helen before I sign off. Is there any medical treatment option for acromegaly? 
Um, we'll probably, we will cover this in a specific talk. Maybe I could tack it on to the end of DKA, but there are some, but they're not, not particularly good. So now that we have hypophysectomy available, um, that would be the treatment of choice, but there are some injectable versions that can be really cost prohibitive, um, but there, there's a handful of them, but there are medical treatments, but probably not good medical treatments is the answer. Awesome. Excellent. We've got a lot of thanks coming through the messages, but other than that, no more questions. Super. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you Wednesday morning. Otherwise, it will be me on Friday at 1 p.m. And what I'm going to do is go through some blood glucose curves um, and also some DKA um, blood results and things and talk about, you know, what we do in different situations with different kind of levels of dehydration and stuff to treat DKA. So we will cover a little bit of that on Friday. You're off the hook, Liz. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. No worries at all. Um, so I will send out reminders to everybody. If anybody does want their reminders to be received a different way, then let me know or to a personal email or anything. My email address is Anna at northsidevetspecialist.com.au. Um, thanks so much for coming. Cheers, guys. Cheers.